What's up my fellow actors, Kurt Yu here from actingcareercenter.com. I'm really excited to share with you today's video because it's an interview with my good friend, Jose Miguel Vasquez, who you may know from shows like Cobra Kai, The Walking Dead, and most recently, the new Netflix miniseries, The Liberator. Now, before we get to the interview, I just wanna give a quick reminder to those people who are new to the channel. If you're interested in learning more about how to prepare for an audition, I've actually created a free 10-step audition preparation guide, which I call my audition cheat sheet. And you can download that free cheat sheet by going to that link right up there. It's the audition process that I have used for many, many years that has helped me book dozens of movies and television shows. So again, if you're interested, download it with that link up there. All right, let me tell you more about today's interview. I met Jose about a year and a half ago while we were working on a movie together. Hopefully that movie will be coming out this year and we'll be able to talk about that. But uh, as soon as we met, we kind of just clicked because... Uh, we had a lot in common. Not only were we both actors, but we also both appeared on the show Cobra Kai, and we found out that we both had YouTube channels. So immediately we had a lot to talk about, and um, I wanted him to share some of that information on my YouTube channel with you. So he was very generous with his time, and uh, we talked for about an hour and a half uh, with, uh, about topics like how he got cast in Cobra Kai, how he got cast in The Walking Dead. Um, he also gives a lot of great advice for young actors because Jose used to uh, teach a class at the Alliance Theater uh, to young actors and he is also a father of a group of young actors at home as well. So he, have so he has so much knowledge about that subject and he shares a lot about it in the interview. Um, he also talks about his YouTube channel, Magilive. It's a very different channel than mine, but it's also very cool. I'll put a link to his channel down in the description below. In his channel, his whole family is on that channel and they do a lot of cool videos, a lot of reaction videos to movie trailers and, and TV show episodes and things like that. Again, I'll put a link down in the description. And then finally, Jose and I spend some time talking about The Liberator, which is such a cool show, especially because he plays one of the main characters on that show. The Liberator is a Netflix miniseries that came out uh, a couple months ago in November of 2020. And it's a kind of a groundbreaking show in terms of how it was made because it was uh, kind of a blend between live action and animation. And when I first saw the trailer, I was blown away by um, how like stylized and artistic it looked. Um, so we have a great conversation about that because Jose traveled all the way to Poland to film The Liberator. So I asked him a lot about what his experience was like, you know, going all the way around the world to film uh, that show and then also the challenges of shooting something that was half live action and half animated. But anyway, I'll stop talking and let's get right into this interview with Jose Miguel Vasquez. What's going on, Jose? How you doing, man? Hey, man, I'm doing great. Thank you. Excited to hang out with you today and just chat, talk shop, talk storytelling. Um, you know, you know, I admire you a lot, man, and look up to you. So the fact that you wanted to spend some time today is is quite quite the honor. So thank you. Thank you for having oh, thanks, me. Man. Today, man. Well, likewise, likewise, for sure. I'm, I'm yeah. super happy that you were able to come on here and gracious with your time to to, to chat with me. Um, I there's a lot I want to ask you about. Uh, I know that a lot of the people that follow my YouTube channel are fans of shows such as Cobra Kai, such mm. as The Walking Dead, and you've been on both of those shows and some other like amazing projects as well. So the first couple things I just want to ask are what was it like for you? I mean, we have a shared credit on Cobra Kai, which is super yes. cool. So yes. what was it like for you? Because uh, I've talked about my experience working on Cobra Kai before. Uh, what what was it like for you as the principal on um, on that show? Well, I um, getting getting on the show was exciting because the very first audition I got was for another role, and I wasn't familiar with the show at the time. And at the time, the show was still on YouTube, so I was like, "Oh, what is this? That's right." And then I kind of did the research, and I was like, "Oh, this is a continuation of." So my my fanship toward Cobra Kai was extremely gradual. Yeah. And the more I started to do research, research became, holy crap, I love this show. <laughs> yeah. And now I'm just like a fan of the show. Yeah. 
And that first role audition that I didn't get, I was bummed about because I'm like, man, I actually really like the show. Mm -hmm. It would be amazing to get on it. And so getting on as as the principal, I was very excited because, you know, sometimes when you're starting out in this work, but you, you, you pay your dues, you do the job that you do. And I have this like tendency to get roles where I die. And <laughs> I, there's really not a chance for me to come back. <laughs> yeah. so, so the fact that on paper, Principal Lopez had this like, hey, he's not going, he's not going anywhere. Yeah. Maybe there's a chance. So that was exciting. Um, also, I was excited to find out that I was going to be have, I was going to share a scene with Paul Hauser. Holy moly, that yeah. was exciting. Um, he is someone I look up to so much, and and so um, that that in and of itself was was a treat. But like anything that I'm a fan of, when you get on set, th- th- there had there had to be a moment where I was like, all right, I have to stop being a fan because now right. I'm in it. I have right. to participate. It's so hard so, to on that set. Oh, it is. <laughs> yes. And I know you know that too because yeah. there's, there's so many things that, that we experience mutually that when we finally met, I was like, wait, you were in Cobra Kai? Yeah. And then rewatching it once it hit Netflix, I paused it and I told the family, guys, yeah. that's Kurt. That's Kurt. That's, that's my friend. It's awesome. Um, so it's, it's wonderful to find out that you, that this world, I think you and I have talked about this before. The world that we live in in this in this industry it's small and you yeah start to really connect with people and it's a beautiful thing man definitely yeah i share the same sentiments about the being a fan first and trying to turn that off when you're on set yeah i've told people the story of and this will lead me into my next question for you mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is that i was a fan of the walking dead before i even got into acting you know, mm-hmm. I was already started because Walking Dead started in 2008. And that was like when I first just started taking acting classes. And when I first started taking acting classes, it was just because I was looking for something to do. There was no thought in my head to, you know, try to become an actor. Right. Mm-hmm. So for a while, I was just a fan of the show. And then even after I started taking acting classes, even when I got my first agent and was like auditioning, this was I was in Cleveland. So we were auditioning for local commercials and industrials right. and that type of stuff not a single thought in my head of like potentially reading for that show or being on that show you know walking dead was like light years away from what i was doing in cleveland uh so i remember my first time in atlanta it wasn't even an audition for me it was my roommate got an audition for walking dead and uh, me and my roommate we had both moved down from cleveland and I was gonna be his reader, right? So he forwarded me the email, and I remember getting goosebumps just seeing the yeah. words "Walking Dead" on the subject line of the email. Like, oh my gosh, this is yeah. crazy! Yeah. Uh, so that leads me to my next question for you: <laughs> What was it like for you working on the Walking Dead? Because it's such an iconic franchise, uh, oh, man. and it was, it's it's Atlanta's first big big show, yes. and, and almost yes. it almost single handedly kind of put atlanta on the map in terms of film and tv production you know i was still in orlando when i first heard about the show Mm -hmm. i heard i heard about it through another actor who was a fan of the show far far before anyone else in in central florida that's right trained in orlando so when we when we heard this guy his name is carlos great actor fantastic actor carlos and he was talking about the show talking about the show and when he talked to that, at one, it was like a zombie show. I was like, ooh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm kind of terrified of zombies. So I, okay. I was always like, well, let me see. Maybe I'll give the show a try. And I never really did, um, mainly because I had kids at the house and mm. it was hard to watch it. So fast forward a couple of years, my cousin tells me about it. And I'm like, okay, so maybe it's not just about zombies. And I gave it a shot. My first episode of The Walking Dead was when Carol is bunkered up with um i forget the black actor the black character's name it's one of the little girls remember the little girls um the one little girl yeah yeah yeah, yeah, I'm, gonna yeah, yeah. Spo- I'm gonna spoil it a bit no i get you know i know you what know, you're talking about yep you know where i'm going yep and there was very little zombies in that episode yeah. it was just the, the tension mm-hmm. of her taking care of these two girls mm-hmm. that reminded her of, of you know her her daughter and mm-hmm. it's just such an amazing an amazing episode yeah that I fell in love with Carol as, uh, as you know, Melissa McBride as, as Carol. I yeah. fell in love with this world. 
that felt more real than I expected it to. And that started me off. So that episode was my first episode. And then I, I forced myself to start the whole series. And I started it with my son and my wife. And we just watched all of it, all of it. And in the midst right of Right from that, the beginning? Yes. Wow. Started from, from season one. And in the midst of, of watching the show, somewhere around, around that time, I got an audition for it. And just as you described, I mean, I'm in the thick of just living in the, to the point yeah. where I was driving through the city and I would just get goosebumps from driving through the city because yeah. we'd pass by Gr- Grady Hospital and we'd pass yeah, by all these yeah. places that were like, okay. oh my God, this is, this is it. Like, see, I'm, ta- I'm getting goosebumps right now. <laughs> and it's like, this is, I'm driving through this world, right? Um, so when I get the, the audition, Kurt, oh my God, it was just like, goosebumps galore and and then you had to like i had to say all right no i got i gotta just get to work i did the audition i felt it i felt it felt great um i didn't hear anything for three months it was three months and i was in the middle of teaching at the alliance theater i was in a summer camp i was screening a little movie that we did with second and third graders yeah when i get the avail check from my agent to work an episode of the walking dead I remember the world stopped. Crazy. I think somebody was talking to me, and I was just like, <laughs> all I heard was, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. Yeah. and I, I said, I'm available, I'm available, let me know what happens. Yeah. By the time I got to my car, at the end of the day, they're like, they want to book you for this. And I'm like, oh. what? I'm like, are, do I even have lines? Like, what? And I was like, I don't care if I don't have lines. I just want to be, anyway. Like, nothing um, for three months, and then a veil check and booked all within. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just like that, um, mm. which, you know, it, it, it's a testament to something that Carlos taught us because um, he got on the show. He, mm-hmm. he did a couple episodes on the show. He played, um, oh, what is the character's name? I forget the character's name. He was part of the kingdom. Okay. Uh, forgive me, Carlos, if you ever hear this or see this. Um, anyway, he was part of the kingdom. He was on for a couple episodes. I think he got eight or nine episodes or something. Really awesome role. Um but he told us that he found out when he was, you know, kind of talking to producers and such, they watch everything and they remember folks. Folks, yeah. they like the, the people that stand out, that they eventually know they're going to find somewhere to put them. Yeah. They'll come back to them, even if it's three months, a year mm-hmm. later. Mm-hmm. Um, and they may have them read again if it's been too long. And, and they just kind of find where to put these folks that they just, they just can't forget. So, I mean, talk about talk about some good feedback as an actor, you know, where you... You find out that they kept your tapes and they found somewhere to put you mm-hmm. um, because they had the need and they found your essence fits there. That that felt amazing. Being on the show was one of the most educational experiences I've had to date um, because I was I didn't have a lot to say. My character didn't have a lot of weight in the story. It 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 just I had I was very much about a, a part of this world that I've been watching for so long. Mm. And, and to be in, in, in the element of it, any people who ever see the episode, I'm, I'm a part of the sanctuary and, and Negan's world and all of that, right? Um, the experience of being on set, seeing the studio set up, I mean, it takes your breath away. That was one of the hardest, I got to turn off the fan in me and play yeah. Uh, because I was surrounded by so much that I was more accustomed to admiring than, you know, preparing myself to be a part of. Um, but, you know, a, 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 after rehearsal, I think it was during rehearsal that I, 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 I allowed myself to, to say, all right, um, I'm, in, I'm in this. I, it's time to, it's time. And I did get a line. So if, if for folks that haven't seen the episode, I got a line. So because you know you've got to interact, it's, that immediately puts you out of your head, you know? So when you first booked it, you didn't know if you had lines or not? Mm-mm. Yeah, no, they, I mean, the secrecy is, um, I mean, bar none, I think Marvel's kind of continued there, and Marvel mm-hmm. and, and, you know, these Stranger Things, these mm-hmm. shows that are sh- super hush-hush, I wonder if they've taken the model from mm-hmm. from The Walking Dead and everything that, mm-hmm. you know, Greg Nicotero and all of them do, because literally I had no idea. I had no idea what I so was doing. So your audition was just a dummy scene, or was it a scene? Correct. Okay. Yep. They're just mock sides. Mm. You know, it was, 
It was a scene from like season one, I think. Oh, a okay. scene similar to season one because oh, it was never okay. verbatim. Yeah. It, you because I was watching the show. Yeah. When I got the audition, I, I it felt like season one, like some right. of the dynamics going yeah. on in season one. So I knew, um, I knew that they were mock sides because it, it's something that had already happened in in the universe of The Walking Dead. Um, so yeah, they throw mock sides at us because they're just trying to get a feel for our essence and such Mm -hmm. and then they plug you in wherever you know wherever however they they feel we fit so it was it was an incredible experience that's amazing i love that story i got goosebumps hearing you talk about it (laughs) and and, one of the things i really love is the uh the idea that you mentioned of you know they're gonna keep watching if they see an audition that they like and if you even if you don't fit a particular character they're trying to cast at that point they're going to remember you and it's a lesson that i think all actors will eventually learn at some point um i try to tell people that but it's hard sometimes you know it, it, without experiencing it for yourself it's hard sometimes to take some of those messages to heart uh when someone's just telling you but um i also love it when other people also kind of um hammer that point you know uh, yeah. into people's heads because it's it's uh, it really is that's the career it's not so much mm-hmm. each individual audition that you're doing um, Tim Phillips has that book called audition for your career not the job right and I think yes. just that just the quote just the title of that book is so profound in that you're you're never just reading for that role you never mm-hmm. know what they may be considering you for before and that actually is very similar to my story with uh, Cobra Kai I read for Cobra Kai like four or five times, um, all kinds of different characters, and they were just trying to fit, you know, they, they they liked what I was doing, but they just were trying to figure out where I fit. And then eventually, the role that I ended up booking, I, I didn't read for Like, they just had a role come up, and they're like, you know what? Kurt would be good for this, so let's just put him Look in at it. That. Look yeah. at that. And that. Yeah. And it just worked out that way. You, you were building a relationship. Yeah. In those four or five auditions, you know, and that's something I've, I've kind of train my mind to start seeing as um, and it's taken years to really shift that mindset of every audition i'm doing i'm 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 given an opportunity to build a relationship with that casting director and potentially those producers if they've already seen some of my stuff and you what you just shared is exactly that you've you kind of you had already set yourself in front of them right and now it really was just i I, it's almost I, i call them you know, because of my, my, my faith life it aligns so much with my art life. I call it a God, a, a God moment. They were probably just like, boom, that's what's that guy? Kurt, right? Let's get him. This is, this is totally him. And, you know, cause they've seen you so yeah. much already. You, yeah. you had already created a, 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 a story element that they could right. clearly put in there. So I, I love that. I love that. And I think if, if, if we're telling people that are learning how to do this, that, that they're building relationships, I think that's, that's the right place to start. And I didn't, didn't start there. And that's a pretty tough journey to take. Yeah, I think most people don't start there because we think uh, when, when we're just getting into the industry and not knowing anything about the industry, we mm. think it's just, all right, well, it's like any other job then, you know, we'll get an application and apply for mm-hmm. work as an actor and then mm-hmm. they hire you or, or they don't. But uh, it's it's so much of the industry is built on relationships which in in one respect like a lot of other industries are as well but um in in terms of this it's i feel like there's more to it because there's relationships to be built like all across the board with other actors with your teachers with casting directors with producers with directors like the more people that you have in your network that's you know industry wide the better it's going to be for your career definitely man yeah. I agree a hundred percent with that, you know, and I think the, the slow moments are, or even when you're starting and you were like, I don't have an agent. I don't, mm-hmm. You start to wonder, man, it, 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 am I doing this for the right reasons? Mm-hmm. And, but it, it's in those weird, quiet lulls of time that you're building. So you should be building something. You should trust you're building something. So, and that's, that's something I've, you know, at times struggled with. <laughs> yeah, totally. The silence, yeah. Be, the silence could be a little bit daunting. <laughs> yeah. And th- that, in that respect, like the more that you can find things to do on your own rather than just waiting by the phone or yes. waiting and checking your emails to see if your agent's contacting you or whatever, the more mm-hmm. that you can, you know, put into your own hands and take control of your career, 
uh, the better it's going to be. I, I want to ask you something to see yeah. if this happens to you, Kurt. Mm -hmm. do, do you ever find that it's it's when you're not thinking about the work or the job or the or the thing or or whatever? Maybe you're out doing a grocery run or you're going to run an errand that has nothing to do, or maybe you're coaching someone or teaching or you know, your mind is just not on the phone or the email. Yeah. That's when, does that happen to you? It that, feels that, like that, right? It, it feels like yeah. that, and sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. Like sometimes you're on vacation and you're like, oh man, <laughs> I, can't, I can't do yes. it. Yeah. Uh, but, but it does feel like, like that. It's kind of like the old uh, watch pot never boils type of thing. Like as soon as exactly. you take your mind off of it, like something might um, come around. And, and I think that's another thing as, as far as, uh, you know, piggybacking on what we were just talking about the more that you can kind of take your mind off of it and not not in this, even even away from uh like you're saying away from acting in general too um because a lot of the career can feel like waiting and can feel like you know there's nothing i can do um and we we just talked about like creating your own projects but even like if you leave the industry altogether and find other things that interest you so that your just your life in general feels more full and feels more fulfilled. So you're not yeah. just looking for a booking to feel good about yourself. You know, that's I think that's a big part of it. It really is. I I agree with you a hundred percent. Um it, it gives you it gives me peace of mind to have something else. Yeah. Besides the acting, looking at the phone, looking at yeah. the emails. Um sure, I have a family but even in that, there's times where I'm, I might be doing stuff with them that if, I'm, if my mind and my soul is just still anchored on the phone and the email, am I going to get that call? Or mm -hmm. it, it, It's a double whammy because I'm not taking full advantage of the moment with them. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I'm kind of suffocating what may be boiling and trying to kind of come up into the sphere of creative opportunity mm -hmm. if I'm just like hovering over this opportunity that might come yeah. so i've discovered if i can just you know it's it's kind of what we do in our training i know you're i know you do a lot of meisner based stuff and you know when, when we do old moment just move on like forget about it it's yeah. done right yeah it's that whole thing just leave it alone yeah. you did the work you did the audition jose leave it alone man just go continue living be alive be a participant of this whole thing and sure enough when i do that well Holy moly, that's when the thing starts to ring. That's when the emails start to ding. Because I'm not thinking about it anymore. Yeah. I'm just not attached to it anymore. You know? That's something great. Else has, it's just something else takes the, a, a better position in my life as opposed to the obsession of this job. Um, so anyway. I love teaching, take, taking that Meisner teaching into, uh, into this career. I've, I've never thought about it that way, but you're 100% right. Talk, letting go of the past moment uh, mm -hmm. is... Mm -hmm. is yeah, it's really important. Uh, all right, let's let's uh, pivot back to some of your some of your other acting roles. Um, I'm interested to hear, other than you know Cobra Kai and Walking Dead are, are the really popular ones. I'm interested to hear some of um, if you have any other favorite memories from working on any projects, uh, favorite shows you've worked on, or or things like that. Because you know one one thing that I really admire from just watching your demo reel is that you you seem to have a really great range of characters that you've played uh Thank you, you, you mentioned that your characters seem to die a lot uh, but uh <laughs> but but it, it's it's true because i tend to play mainly the uh suit and tie corporate type which i know you play as well like the principal is you know a, a mm -hmm. type of role like that right but then uh, you also play the other end of the spectrum some of these you know edgier type of characters and mm -hmm. um just off of your demo reel there's some great ones the liberator is another it's another mm -hmm. uh example right so um yeah what are some other roles that uh, you can think of that are that are really memorable uh that have um really stood out brian banks working okay. on the film brian banks was um to date i would tell you I mean, the, the Liberator was, and we'll talk about the Liberator, mm -hmm. but that in and of itself was a, a kind of a life-changing ex experience. But I will always say, before the Liberator came, Brian Banks. Wow. And um, getting to work on that film was the one of those first times that I felt 
because at first I was like, I was, I was drawn to the role of playing a district attorney. Mm -hmm. So I was like, this is, this is new for me. I, I get to kind of break out of the stereotype mold that I kind of get thrown into these edgier roles and, um, the, you know, the, the Latino badass or, or the, or the Latino, you know, thug or whatever. Um, which <laughs> that's I'll so do. funny because I don't see that type from you. Like that, know, that's not the first thing that I think of. <laughs> I, you know, I, it's, and it's something I've learned about my career. You know, you get to a point in your career where you know what your strong suits are, mm. you know, you know, you know what flavor of ice cream you're selling. Yeah. And I mean, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll provide you a, a sample of that flavor. I don't necessarily think it's the most potent one that people sure. would be like, yeah, you know, this is really, this is really your thing. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely do it um i'm not sure that it reads as believable as as others might but anyway i digress um so brian banks i got on uh, i got this audition for a film shooting in memphis with uh, about the story about this prodigy football player who was wrongly accused of rape in high school and um and the whole of the story is just i mean it just blew my mind and mm -hmm. and to see that i'd, I'd have a, a a part in a film where Again, that character weight matters so much to me. Not necessarily the amount of lines. It's what does that character bring to the story? And I played, I got to play District Attorney Rafael Mateo, who's based on a real person. Um, in fact, I think that's his real name in the actual story. But you have this element of based on real events, right? Um, football, which I love football. You and I were talking a little bit of, of football here. This, Brian Banks' story is. I mean, in and of itself, just just knowing the story, you're like it just lifts you up, you know, the the power of resilience and the power of family and all that. Um, and then there was all the acting stuff that happened, which was the audition, which was I had six seven scenes, which we don't normally get wow. here in the, in the south. Yeah. So when I got that, I was like, man, this is and this is for a film, and it's kind of like an in, it felt like an indie film. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, this is really really wonderful. Then I got the call back. And the director is Tom Shadiak, who, if anybody knows Tom Shadiak, awesome that you know him by name, but he, he's known for his movies. Uh, Ace Ventura, Bruce Almighty, Evan Almighty, you know, this guy. And he does, he's, he's done work that has always mattered to him, you know, has always wanted to, he's always wanted to make an impact. Mm -hmm. um, so when I found out, I had a callback with Tom Shadiak. You know, I was like, okay, this is going to be like, I, I set up in here. I had my whole thing set up. It was a mm -hmm. Skype thing. I was back in my suit and I was ready to do my four or five, six scenes, whatever it was. And lo and behold, he just wanted to talk like we're talking now. Oh, wow. He, he wanted to check my heart where, yeah. where my soul was on the story and why I wanted to be a part of the cast and, and how Brian, Brian's story impacted me as an, as an individual and, we talked for like 20 minutes, 20 minutes. And he was in the middle of getting pre-production done and some and doing filming because they had already started filming by the time they were doing my callback. A lot of my stuff happens at the end of the film. Okay. So scheduling had me coming in later. Okay. But then I got to meet Aldous Hodge, who was going to be playing um, DC's Hawkeye, or sorry, Hawkman, forgive mm -hmm. me, yeah. Hawkman. Aldous Hodge, I got to work with Aldous. I got to work with Greg Kinnear. Mm -hmm. I had... Oh, a wonderful amount of scenes with those two mm -hmm. mega actors there. I mean, it was a, it was a school of, it was an acting class, yeah. a master class. And, and just to spend time with those guys, I was on set for two weeks. I got to work with Sherry Shepard. I mean, just these names that have been in the game. They've, and I got to meet Aldous's family, his mom specifically. And we talked on, on the side of the set. I got to meet Brian Banks in real life. It's just that kind of connection. And I don't mean like, network business connection i'm talking life human to human yeah. connection where you hear their story yeah. and you hear how aldous got to where he got and you hear how brian finally got to tell his story that oh man that stuff just changes you it mm -hmm. changes you and it i think it broke me open in a way that you know i've always said every role prepares you for the next one mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how how big or small mm -hmm. but every single role is kind of molding you and prepping you for the next thing to come. And I'll always say Brian Banks really did set the foundation for what came later in the Liberator. Yeah. That's amazing. I love that story. How, how long ago was that? Man, we shot that. Oof. <sighs> three years ago, maybe three. It, okay. took, it took a bit to get distributed. Um, 
So it's it's I always it's always hard because I remember we shot it. It took about a year and a half for it to hit the LA Film Festival, which it won audience mm. the audience award at the LA Film Festival. But then it took another year for it to see the light of day in theaters. Um, so I, I think it was 2017, 2018. I think the IMDb has it registered the year that it came out. In yeah, theaters, yeah, yeah. A little bit more worldwide, but right. Yeah, or nationwide. Wow. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I love hearing about. I, I've heard from other friends too about some of you know some of their kind of career changing experiences, and it's always something that you know. Uh, I don't want to say always, but a lot of times it's something that you're not expecting to hear from from people. Like they'll they'll, they'll mention like this is great because Brian Bakes is more of like kind of an indie project, right? Because yeah. it went to festivals first before uh, going to theaters, and you know when most people ask you about like kind of career changing life changing experiences uh, of uh, working on set you know they're expecting to hear oh it was walking dead or oh it was mm-hmm. you know yeah. the, the the big big projects um but sometimes it is it's it's the the things that maybe a lot of people haven't heard about i have a similar one too of like my first time working on a tv show was on uh, the uh the Fox uh, miniseries called Shots Fired. Okay. And, uh, and it's, you know, nobody really knows about the show. It was only mm-hmm. a miniseries, so it's not like it ran multiple seasons. And even it, when it was on, it wasn't, like, super popular, so a lot of people hadn't seen it. But Shots it was, Fired, that rings a bell. Shots Fired. Yeah, it was 2016. Filmed in 2016, came out in 2017. Uh, it was shot in North Carolina. But for me, it was it was just... One being my first time on a television show set uh, hmm. as a as a principal performer. I was one time as a stand-in, but uh, it's my first time working on a TV show, and it was <laughs> the very first. Imagine being the very first time working on a TV show, and the two people you're opposite are two Oscar winners. So that <laughs> that was oh me my God. Uh, with uh, with Richard Dreyfuss and Helen Hunt. So oh I like goodness, I would man. never forget that moment of like I was literally shaking like I, I couldn't believe you know wow. what I was going to be part wow. of and and we were the only people speaking in the scene it was the two Oscar winners and myself like I was <laughs> the third person that needed to talk and that's your first one that's yeah. your first gig yeah. oh my goodness I'm literally I, I I'm I'm shaking I remember that if you if you watch the footage the one uh part where I'm talking and the coverage is on me there was a moment where I visibly like shift in the seat and that's because of nerves it was totally because of nerves wow. um like it's it's it, it wasn't that exaggerated like I uh, yeah I think you're probably maybe in your mind you, yeah I, in my mind it was huge and because I knew I did it when I watched it back I noticed it immediately but nobody else notices it. it's it's like pretty yeah, minor right. But I know right. that that was a nervous thing that caused me to move for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, uh, let's let's uh, bring it back to a, a, a couple other things uh, before we talk about the Liberator, because I have so many uh, questions about the Liberator. Um, but um, I want to touch on a, a few things with um, outside of your personal career. So, like I mentioned, that there are some younger actors, or did I mention this already, or did we talk about it off air? I can't remember. <laughs> but but uh, I, there there are plenty of young actors that watch my YouTube channel that are probably like middle school, high school age. And I know you have worked with young actors quite a bit. You mm-hmm. you've uh, taught at the Alliance Theater. You also have uh, kids that are getting into acting. So, what is some of your advice for the younger actors that are just getting started and um, you know that are trying to get into this industry and and maybe don't know exactly what they want to do yet you know there's so many options you know there's right. obviously there's theater there's film there's tv and there, there's uh, all kinds of different avenues for them so you know what what's kind of your advice for the people that are just you know wide-eyed and wondering what to do yes uh this is a fantastic question and i think it it has my answer is obviously affected by this world we're living in the the pandemic mm-hmm. and yeah um covid and 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 the lack of ability to really go out and do social things amongst them theater you know yeah. um i think middle school and high school kids some of the best things they could do is any kind of live performance 
So that means if you if you're in chorus or orchestra in school, um, maybe some schools have drama programs. Um, maybe there's a community theater that you can do um, work through. All of that has been impacted because if I if that used to be my answer, mm-hmm. but now social distancing. Some places are open, some are not. Families are quarantining while others are not. It's just completely. It's unpredictable. It's unstable. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so the advice is this now. My advice is, at the very least, be careful with distractions. Because if you know you have a passion for this career, potential career, um, and I think it helps to identify, do I love this as a potential career? Or do I love it as, maybe it's just a hobby. Maybe it's just something I, I want to do as a creative outlet. And, mm-hmm. and if that's the case, awesome. There's, I think that awareness alone helps you start with, all right, well, if it's going to be a career then you know like these young athletes you've got these kids that are in soccer teams and they're they're still doing sports and you know take that athletic approach to it the discipline aspect of it visit your craft daily you there's no reason not to there's at least three times a week if you're going to be moderate about it you know you've got families that that get their kids to soccer or football or baseball or cheerleading fill in the blank and they go out to these practices twice a week once a week three times a week so, you know, find a consistency to, to the craft, whether you're singing or dancing or acting or all three, find a consistency. And if it's just a creative outlet, I would say, at the very least, start watching television differently, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Netflix, Hulu, whatever show you're watching, whatever genre it is, comedy, um, you know, drama, all, any of the above, Allow yourself to feel it more. Don't start start becoming more of a participant in the story. <clears throat> Excuse me, coffee's drying up my throat. Hmm. And become more of a participant where you're sitting there and you're feeling everything that the young cast or the cast is feeling. You know, these these shows that are that are on these days, there's a lot of reality TV and that that's a little bit different, but I'm talking about scripted narratives. You know, where you've got characters that are facing conflicts that have mm-hmm. probably life situations that you don't as a as a young performer. Yeah. Um, and try to empathize with that. So I, I just try to tell my young actors, including my own kids, keep a journal, keep a journal, become more emotionally aware of how you're doing. Mm-hmm. You know, wake up in the morning or at the end of your day and, and just find the courage to say to yourself, I don't feel good today or I feel great because dinner sucked dinner was delicious breakfast is the same thing again mom and dad are getting on my last nerve they took my phone yet again i wish i could throw my phone into the sky and let it fly away and come back with three million phones i mean i don't know i'm i'm simply saying sometimes just spilling out your emotions on a page starts to train you to become more emotionally aware Mm. a lot of our youth today they're getting numbed out by this thing they're a lot of the emotions are getting locked up in here and locked up in here and then there's no there's no conduit to which to get free um so i I, you know i'll tell you what it is such a tough world for for the young actors out there today because we're secluded more than ever the machines that we use are becoming less tools and more manipulative and and they're occupying our creative ability um so it i i I really i really have a, a sensitive heart for these young young ones because they have the desire but they don't understand why they feel so blocked most of the time yeah um maybe because i'm a parent but i'm also a creative and i know what i struggle with with Mm -hmm. this Mm -hmm. getting in my creative way and so that's my biggest advice avoid distractions identify if it's a hobby or a career and depending on that find a consistency of work toward it a a consistency of attention toward the craft and then just trust the rest of it. Trust that you're going to find the right elements to fit into the into the scope of, of your journey in this wild and crazy ride that we're on, Kurt. <laughs> yeah, they don't have to rush it right away when they're so young. Correct. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I love that. I, I love that advice because it's actionable because it's not, you know, like we said before, there can be a lot of this career where you feel like you're waiting. You know, the things that you're talking about, they can be doing uh, 100% of the mm-hmm. time whenever you know, whenever they just have some time. Uh, it's probably something that I could, I should be doing too, because I think that's a great 
way to um, you know ex explore your what your emotional vulnerabilities are and and what is affecting you right now because that changes over time. Uh, I, does, I honestly yep. I, I experienced this recently when when I uh, like maybe two months ago when I rewatched Jurassic Park, which I've already seen a hundred times, but um, <laughs> right right when I, I rewatched Jurassic Park and uh, I feel like as I've gotten older, certain moments affect me differently, right? And the, the moment when this last time that I watched it, the moment when um, Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler first see the dinosaurs, yeah. right? when they're being driven in the Jeeps yeah. and, uh, and, and Ellie's still looking at the leaf you know, the prehistoric leaf and she's not paying attention and Alan's just like riding around and then all of a sudden, you know, he takes off his glasses you know, and, yeah. and, and looks at the... And that moment got me so emotional when yeah. they first... It's getting it. you emotional now. Yeah. I love it, man. And, and now, you know, when I was a kid, I was like... When I was a kid, I was more like, ooh, cool, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Dinosaurs and stuff like that. But now I'm more connected to the humans, like more connected with these these two paleontologists who have been devoted their whole lives to paleontology and studying dinosaurs and all of a sudden oh my god this is like real yeah. life dinosaur and that the i mean the actors portrayed it so well and it was shot so well obviously you know steven spielberg but 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 uh i think that's so it's such a great thing to to be able to do is to to be, to figure out what it is that's affecting you personally mm -hmm. emotionally mm -hmm. and understanding that so that you can apply it to your acting uh, because so many people think, um, myself included, everybody that I think when we were first getting started is we were thinking of acting as being other people, you know, mm -hmm. and pretending yeah. to be someone else. But, um, but the reality of it is that first we have to understand ourselves. First we have to be able yeah. to tap into everything of ourselves first mm -hmm. um, before we can try to even branch out into doing anything, you know. What, what a great gift you gave yourself, man, to have that openness so that moment would hit you different as often yeah. as you've seen that movie. Yeah. I, yeah. And, I, and as, as I watched you talk about it, it, it got me going too because, and that's what it's about. It's if the person you're observing and participating with is letting themselves feel it, mm -hmm. and if you're open to it, you're going to feel it too. It, it's yeah. just, that's the beauty of what we do. Um, and it's it's fascinating what you say about what acting is for some people. And you hear different kinds of things. I saw an interview recently with Margot Robbie, and she was talking to, oh, who she, I, I, I'm drawing a blank. It was one of these actors on actors variety mm -hmm. type of interviews that we were kind of hint, talking about before we started. And she made a comment about that, that she enjoys playing other people. But I, 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 found, it, I found it interesting she used those specific words because clearly she has such an awareness of her toolkit what she has to offer in the world of acting that she is able to then immerse herself in such a different circumstance that she would ever live in yeah. but because she understands all of herself then she can be this other person yeah and then therefore when you hear a margot robbie say yeah i love playing other people um I, that tends to be a little confusing i think for the younger actors right Right. You know, uh, where then they think, yeah, I don't really like myself too much. So I just love playing other people. Mm -hmm. Whereas what I've discovered and I've met other very successful actors, including yourself, that when you start to embrace who you are mm -hmm. fully mm -hmm. and you start to really love who you are and what you have to offer, including like I'll be very I'll try to be vulnerable here. Like I have thinning hair. I've had to learn how to love that. So that I can still do my job as an actor, show up and tell the story as authentically as I can, and not get hung up on, um, am I tall enough? Do I have a mm -hmm. long enough hair? You know, there has to come a point where you find this grace with yourself, so that when you're asked to play someone that you're not, right, you can still do that as authentically as possible. Yeah. And I think that's something that someone like a Margot Robbie has done, where she's got, and all the all these other actors where they find such a place with themselves that is just enough of a balance where they know exactly what they have to work with and they create this little miracle of this other act, this other character rather yeah. has come to life. So I, I want to share something really quick with you because I've never told you this. Sure. 
But watching you right now talk about Jurassic Park, it reminded me of it. I remember the first time that we hung out and we got to work on something together. And I got to know you and I was like, man, this guy's really cool. You know, and you always get, you get vibes about people. And you're like, you know, I think this, me and this person are going to get along. But the moment I knew that you were an absolute powerhouse of an actor was we were, I don't know if you remember this, we were having dinner at a Korean restaurant and you were sharing a very beautiful moment about how another actor you knew that you've seen from their very beginning in their journey had had some sort of artistic breakthrough. And your moment of empathy for that actor brought you, you welled up in tears Mm -hmm. and your voice cracked and our dinner hadn't even been brought to us Mm -hmm. yet. And I remember watching you and I remember receiving all of those, like all those vibes and beautiful like empathy that you had for this, this other actor. And I knew it. I'm like, that's why this guy's here. Because he is in the moment. He is authentic. He is 100% generous. And he feels everything that must be felt in order for us, for me right now in this moment, opposite of him to feel this beautiful thing he's feeling. And that that's why I'm, I'm just I, why I told you at the beginning of this thing this is why it's an honor to be talking mm-hmm. to you man because I know it takes a very very special kind of spiritual maturity emotional maturity to let someone affect you as such where then you are now displaying how they let you feel so that Jurassic Park moment you talked about reminded me of our Korean dinner and I had to bring it up yeah well, thank you for bringing it up I 100% <laughs> remember that conversation yes, because we yes. were both sharing I don't want to share what you shared, but but we were both sharing some like personal things about what uh, you know, not just acting wise, but also yeah. you know uh, some of the things that have connected us to to the career and to acting and and what really affects us and um, and like you said that we we got pretty heavy there before <laughs> yeah. we before we even got our food. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man, we didn't intend to. It just yeah. like yeah. It just happened, and it's it's yeah. one of those beautiful things, man. Yeah, really. and and you know, and that's a that's one of the big reasons why I wanted to talk to you again here today. So, you know, the feeling is mutual. I 100% uh, appreciate you coming on and, you, and chatting. Um, I feel like we're gonna go way over an hour here, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> good luck, good luck to you editing this. Oh God. <laughs> no, I don't even think I'm 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 just gonna forget about I'm it. Late. We just put the whole thing up. But uh, <laughs> all right, last thing, last thing I want to chat with you about before we get to uh, the Liberator is that you know one thing that we connected over when we first met was that we both had YouTube channels, and yes. Um, yes. We, we were talking about what we were doing, and both of our channels have since since we met have been growing. Mm-hmm. Um, even then in the past, uh, oh, man, how long has it been? It's been it's, over a year. It's now been over a year. First, wow. We first had that conversation. Wow. Then, uh, August would have been a year. So we're in the end of the year. So that's almost a year and a half now. Year and a half. Jeez. Almost a year and a half. Year uh, and four months to be exact. Yep. So yeah. So, so, and it's interesting cause we have very kind of different YouTube channels and I'd love to, you know, have, have you kind of share what your channel is, tell people, you know, where they can find you and then like how you kind of got your channel started and then what your kind of journey is, has been up until now. Um, I have two words to kind of start this whole thing off. Power Rangers. Power Rangers is what started our YouTube channel, uh, officially. My, my son, my, our, our oldest of the three that we have, um, they've always done these videos. Our three kids have always done these little filming things, music videos and such. If you go down into the old, old days of our YouTube channel, you'll find some of these fun little videos that they did as the little, little kids. Yeah. And then they got us involved. I'm glad you left those up too. Like some people, <laughs> you know, take yeah. off their like older. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the thing is. The way we've always seen our channel is that it's ours. It's our family channel. Mm-hmm. Um, right. And it, 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 it's kind of our place to go back and remember our journey. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and so it's important that we keep that there for us specifically. And we've not found a reason to take them down. So for now, they still live there. Our, our channel is Magilev. It used to be just Magilev Productions because that's our company name. Um, but it was before it was our company name, that was just... Magilev was our acronym. It was an acronym that my wife came up with because it, she kind of took the, all of our names and mixed them around. She's very mathematical like that, and she kind of found this really beautiful one-word thing to kind of d- depict all of us. So Magilev is M-A for Matthew, J-E for Jennifer, and Gemmeline, that's my wife and my daughter, um, respectively. 
and then um, Eli is Eli. That's my son, my youngest son's middle name. And V is Vasquez. That's our last name. J is for Jose. And if you mix the letters around, my middle name is in there, Miguel. It's just it's a, oh, it's wow. a lot. Yeah. So Majeliv, Majeliv rather, M A J E L I V. That was just our thing. Um, and then Power Rangers. Well, one time my son was like, "Hey, Dad, um, I know we usually do like we we have fun filming ourselves talking about movies after we go to the movies. Um, what if we do a reaction to the trailer of Power Rangers before we go see it?" And I was like, "What do you mean a reaction? What what is that? What do you mean like <laughs> us just looking at the really?" And he was so anyway. We had a whole thing. We we listened and we did it. We got a little bit of viewership from it. I thought, okay, this is interesting. Whatever. We went to see the movie. We did the review. We put that up on on the channel. I mean, he did because he was doing all the editing and all that. And how long ago was this? Oh man, three four years ago maybe. Okay. Three okay. or four years ago, something like that. The one that really shocked and changed everything was when he found he he started to get really good at tracking things on social media. And he started to hear the hubbub when the Infinity War trailer was going to drop, and um, and so one night I was I was busy. I, I the last thing I wanted to do was anything like this. But mm-hmm. he was like, "Hey, the Infinity War trailer is about to drop. We need to do the reaction video." And in my head, I was like, "This is the dumbest thing in the world. Reaction <laughs> videos. Like, who's really going to watch this? Yeah. It's just us watching something." Well, lo and behold, it was close to like 10 p.m. or maybe later. I don't even know now. And he's like, Dad, the trailer dropped. We have to do this reaction right now. And I was just so resistant to it. I remember we kind of got into it. This light fell. And because I was anyway, long story short, as resistant as I was to it, we filmed it. We lived in the moment. We reacted to this fantastically epic trailer. And overnight, we had like 50,000 views. Um, It was absolutely ludicrous. It just hit. I think what happened is we we've learned this now, and now that you you know you have a YouTube channel, you know, made a data proves if you if you find the peak moment or right before that peak, mm-hmm. where people are watching something specific before it really starts to trend, if you get if you kind of carry that wave of the trend as it begins, that's it, and mm-hmm. that's kind of what happened mm-hmm. to us. Um, I think by the end of that week, we had over a hundred k, one hundred and twenty thousand views, and. Um, it's our most viewed video right now, I believe. So anyway, that really started to... Now it's like over a million views, right? Yeah, it has over a million views now. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's it's absolutely... Um, you know, it's, strange things started to happen. People were emailing us, asking permission to use our reaction for, for the movie and, mm-hmm. and including us and this and that. And I was like, man, my acting career doesn't get that much attention at the time. <laughs> like, what is going on? Um but anyway, uh, that's what it's become. We started. We started to realize we really enjoy doing this as a family. So we just we focused on getting really good at that, mm. on commentary, on listening to each other, on watching these trailers, and being a little bit more informed. Sometimes we like to go in cold into trailers. We don't know anything about it, and we just try to hit, let it hit us. So that's what our channel is. on On the on the front of it is a lot of reactions to mm-hmm. things. But then once people are in and they start to get to know who we are. We start to share a little bit more about what we do. We're actors, we're storytellers, so we have some short films on there. We have some skits, Great. Um, some fun little things, um, family games and such, vlogs. Uh, my, my wife loves doing vlogs, and Matthew, too. Our, our son was doing a lot of vlogs for a while. And, and so we have it all up there. And so now it's just kind of we have these playlists, and if people want to see it, they can see it. Uh, most of the people that go to our channel go to watch our reactions. Um, the thing that's really trending on our channel now are our, our reactions to the Mandalorian episodes. That's kind of our big, our big um, jazz right now is just man, we're loving this thing. So that's kind of what we do. And in, in short, we do reactions, but we we share a lot of our creative uh, endeavors on there as well. You know, you talked about earlier. It's great to do something while you're waiting. And mm-hmm. you know, my son, our oldest, he's had to find a way to do something creative because he's been waiting a while before finally something came his way. And my my youngest are finding that this channel gives us all a creative hub, a place to stay creative and stay motivated and disciplined and that consistency I was talking about. Um, it's not always a desirable thing to do. I sometimes have to get them to really remember the importance of staying in the constant flow of the work, but it helps in the end. And then the YouTube channel is doing well. So I'm happy about that, you know. That's great. 
Um, and uh, just to really quick jump back on your point about The Mandalorian, I remember when we first met, I had not started watching The Mandalorian yet, and you were telling me that you got to watch that show, and now yes. I'm all caught up. So, oh, good, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good man. Oh my gosh. And so, so you guys are doing reaction videos per episode of The Mandalorian? Correct. Awesome. Yes. 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 Um, Very it's cool. more tedious to edit, if you can imagine. Yeah. Because we want to respect the the production of the show, and and so it's important to edit around it so that people are not getting like a cheap. Yeah. viewing of it um it, it really it's to highlight how we're receiving the episode yeah so it's, it's editing around all that um so the video tends to be you know a little bit longer than our other videos but mm -hmm. people are watching it so and the show is so good mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me the show is so good that you're having people wanting to watch other people react to it <laughs> yeah. yeah so like the last one not not episode six which we we recorded we haven't put it together but yeah. episode five uh, with Ahsoka Tano, you've seen that. Yeah. So I'm not ruining it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, all of that, our reaction to those moments are all on our channel. And um, that one is close to 100K views. It's, it's, oh, that's it's awesome. It's wild. We never, <laughs> we've never had that happen with a, yeah. like a long, longer reaction. Yeah. So it's, it's definitely... Ooh, I'm interested educated. to see what this next one's going to get then. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah, right? Me too. Me too. It's always a... It always kind of boggles my mind what people respond to. You know what though? I'll I'm I'm not gonna spoil anything for people that haven't watched it. So I'll try to talk in a little bit of code. Uh, but yeah. this, I got the the kind of big reveal of this last episode was spoiled for me. No. On like Mandalorian drops on Friday, right? Mm -hmm. And like Friday morning, like 11 a.m. on Friday. I was just browsing my Google News feed on my phone, and there was an article up with with it in the headline of the article Come and on. a picture. Come on. On like a, I mean, it's not a like a legit news outlet, but it's, it's like it's, it's probably somebody's blog or something like that. And you know, Google does their thing where I've read Mandalorian articles before, so that one just pops up on my news feed. And it's 11 a.m. on Friday. Like, I was going to watch it later that day, probably. You know what I mean? How upsetting, like, man. It just dropped. Come on. Uh, Come yeah. on. Yeah. That's, we, that's why we try to delay whenever we post it. Yeah. So that we're, we don't ever want to be the response. And we try to warn people. Um, yeah. I give a little, you know, come yeah, on. Just give a little warning. I mean, yeah. it, it, it's kind of understood in the way we have social media now and everything like that, that it's going to be hard not to get spoiled if you're waiting like more than a few days. Yep. But that being said, like, I think so many people are more respectful now of like, hey, if we're going to talk about it, I'm going to warn first and say, hey, there are spoilers up ahead. You know, if you want to read this article or if you want to even like, if you want to read my Facebook post, they're like, hey, Mandalorian spoilers, if you want to chat about yesterday's episode, yeah, um, yeah. you know, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I was so bummed about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's still a great episode. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Really still enjoyed the episode for sure. Oh, yeah, for sure. But I think oh, yeah. I would have been more excited had I, you know, for sure. Yeah. Oh. Uh, well, you'll, you'll get to see once we post ours, you'll see what. Genuine reactions. Unspoiled. Yes. Yeah. We did right. not know what was coming. Well, I think so. so. This is an interesting thing for people that ask. I've had a few people ask me about, you know, just YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. In general, mm -hmm. of like, how do I, how do I get into YouTube? What should I do? What can I, um, what should I do videos about? And I think your thing is a great example of. Um, you could start off just doing reactions to stuff. Like you don't. It's, you're not really coming up with any content right yeah. you're just yeah. you're and you're doing your genuine actual reactions to whatever is already posted i've seen recently a lot of people posting reactions to stand-up comics you know and, and genius. all they're genius. doing is they're watching you know it'd be like <clears throat> a, a married couple are just watching stand-up comedy like dave chappelle or bill burr or something like that and you get to see their genuine reactions to laughing about it and then they'll pause yeah. and they'll talk about a joke and how it affected them and stuff like that and how it was really true in their life when such and such happened and then they'll play it again and you know uh it's funny when you say like who watches this stuff 
and then you learn that oh, I'm a person that watches this stuff. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I watched, uh, I remember when the uh, Star Wars Force, Force Awakens trailer first dropped. Mm-hmm. I watched like every reaction that I, that was on <laughs> that was on YouTube of, yes. of people like, you know, when they, because the first trailer for that famously had uh, Han Solo and Chewbacca show up at the end mm-hmm. of the trailer, right? Nobody was expecting that. Oh, at, at, getting goosebumps yeah, as you're saying it. Yeah, yes. and I remember like, that happened to me and i was like i gotta watch everybody's reaction to that moment (laughs) of the trailer yes and there's a great one of uh when they showed it at like comic-con or something like that um (laughs) and there was a the reaction of like the crowd the crowd and then you hear the crowd like erupting when they show up and it it, yeah it's it's cool it's really cool and i think you know people that want to just uh get into youtube like that's a i feel like it's a fairly easy way to kind of get into it yeah, but similar it you to a starting point yeah yeah but similar to like what you were saying with um acting and really anything is like you, you do have to develop this consistency to keep going mm-hmm. otherwise mm-hmm. you know you're going to shoot a few videos and then it's just going to drop off and youtube like many other things like acting is really the long game and mm-hmm. you got to keep you got to keep it going keep it rolling um That's and right. eventually you'll get a few things that hit like you said you get a you're reaction to uh infinity war um mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. that just like took off and that that happens it's happened to a couple of my videos like you not everything's gonna hit but when one thing does it brings in a lot of a lot of new subscribers yeah. and a lot of new views onto your right onto your channel right yeah it's it's always a learning curve you know and just when you think you've got to figure it figured out um something new spins on you but it it's it's adaptable to even what we do as actors uh on so many levels i've we've talked about with the kids you know when we watch these let's try to have a genuine reaction like let it hit you and be authentic about it as authentic as you can be you know don't do it because the camera's on just just be right um and that really applies to just some of the basic stuff we do as actors so i i try to always (laughs) that's the teacher in me though i i try to make it a a teachable moment every time yeah it's the teacher and the dad in you yeah exactly (laughs) exactly (laughs) uh all right Cool. I think we've come up on an hour, and we are just about to start talking about the Liberator. <laughs> but, Part two um, video. Part two video. <laughs> yeah. hey, maybe we'll do that. Who knows? Um, all right. So this is. I think this is the thing I've, I've been wanting to talk to you and 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 to kind of do a little interview on my YouTube channel with you uh, already. And then when this thing dropped, um, I, I remember you telling me about this when we had first met and. You know, when it's a new project, uh, you know, obviously, like, when you did Walking Dead, it, you already knew what it was and everything like this. But yeah. this was going to be something brand new for you, right? And then also, when you told me about it, I had no context for what it was going to be. Like, all you told me was, like, your experience working on it and what type of, you know, show it was going to be. But, like, didn't really know what the heck. Like, for me, I didn't know what the heck it was actually <laughs> yeah. going to be, right? Until... The trailer dropped for the Liberator. I was like, "This is what he was talking about. This is huge!" You know, <laughs> I, I was so excited when I finally got to see like what it was um, uh, you had been telling me about. So, like, for for people that haven't seen it or don't know what we're talking about, the Liberator is a uh, mini series, four episodes, four, yes, four episode uh, mini series based on a true story. Uh, that recently came out on Netflix. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It's a animate, a semi-animated uh, show. Very like uh, it, 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 groundbreaking in terms of the animation that they're they're doing. Right, it was the first time that there anybody has done something like this in the Correct. scale. Right, I think some pe- mm-hmm. people have done like some smaller projects, but the, for the scale of this, for it to be on Netflix, it's uh, it's really groundbreaking um, in that respect. So, and, and, and you play one of the main characters of this entire storyline and and your character was also based on a true person, a real person. Actually it was, he's a kind of a, uh, what's it called? Uh, Like a mix of three different. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yes. Okay. So we'll get into all that. So let's, yeah, we'll uh, talk more about that. Let's start with just like, what was your, what was your audition process for this? How did you get involved in, in this show? Um, well, as you know, uh, being an actor yourself, you, we get these emails from our agents with a breakdown and, you know, you get, all right, cool, I have an audition. <clears throat> this one was extremely odd in the best way because two things stood out. One, it was going to be shot in Poland. And then two, one of the producers worked on Lord of the Rings. 
Lord of the Rings, mind you, is the film, Fellowship of the Ring, was the film that really lit that fire in me that I needed to do this for a living. It's a fire I kind of suppressed for uh, some time before I finally did it. But seeing this name wow. on the email list um, absolutely rocked my world, mm -hmm. right? And then obviously that it was in Poland, and then I looked at, because attached to the, to the, the breakdown was more or less a, a similar explanation, uh, or rather a summed up explanation as, as to how the show would be shot. And that part concerned me at first. I was like, oh, well, I don't want to be CGI. Am I, I going to be doing a bunch of VO or voiceover mm -hmm. work? Or... So I was a little bit confused up front. Like, well, what am I really getting into if I, if I actually submit for this? <clears throat> so I, I was very hesitant at first. But you know, you read you read the size, and I was like, "This is this is a full on script." Like, yeah, you know, and and they gave some more instructions because I had some some questions about how how this whole thing, and they said, "No, just go ahead, create the world as you would any audition." This is, and they put in big caps, "This will be shot as as it was live action." Mm -hmm. So I was like, "Okay, fascinating." Mm -hmm. So I just went to work, and um, the the role of Gomez from the get go, I had initially like five maybe six scenes um that they gave me for the audition so i did that and that was probably november of 2018 no yeah what's i more or less early november 18 yes because it was before thanksgiving and and i sent that tape in didn't hear a thing obviously you know then the, the, the thanksgiving hit then the holidays hit january new year comes in 2019 and maybe Oh, I don't know. Maybe toward mid-January, late January, I get an email that says, retape. It was basically an unofficial callback. Mm -hmm. And they sent me eight scenes. Wow. And New they, scenes? They gave, that, that... The scenes I had done, uh -huh. and then more scenes. Wow. With very specific notes. One of them being, ready? Get this. We just want to see more of Jose and his personality. And I was like, uh, fascinating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I took that and, you know, casting directors have a language that sometimes we have to translate. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I really did kind of just understood what they were hit, looking at. I looked at my original tapes. I looked at the second, uh, or rather prepared for the second. Um, and I, I had some other notes on there that were very encouraging in that the director was pretty much very audible about, we really want to see Jose do this. So that was it was very much like it, if it started to feel like it was my role to lose. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I just. Uh, but I mean, again, I really don't know the truth to that. It, it, that's kind of the scenario I painted to myself to give. Again, I'm kind of an athlete in that I, I wanted to have this sense of healthy pressure that I could do this, that I'm sure. the one to do this. Um, and I came down here and for five hours, my son, my son was behind the camera, my oldest son. And there were times where my wife stepped in to help me set up the scene. And, and for five hours, we taped. And then um, I waited almost a month, almost a month, I would say, before I got word that an offer was probably going to come in. Mm -hmm. And um, and by and, March... And to, start, and to start preparing to go to Poland. Start preparing to go to Poland. Mm -hmm. That's right. That was a big deal because my family and I had never been to anything never been through anything like that i've never i had never been to europe yeah let's start with that yeah and and so long story short uh when we got news we got it it was a massive deal here for the house and it was a lot of good news a lot of good feelings but then it was like how, how are we going to do this i'm going to mm -hmm. be gone for two months mm -hmm. um so that it definitely took a toll on our family and we we had to figure a lot of things out um but then being there for two months was my goodness that that was educational it was the best case scenario for the, the kind of dreams that I've always had. I was there for two months and I had four days off. Just four days. Um, where wow. It was just constant work and it was a beautiful cycle of, you know, get up in the morning early, work out and, and get ready for the day and, you know, shoot, shoot, shoot. A lot of, it was just amazing, man. Mm -hmm. I'll let you go on to your next question because I can keep going. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, it's incredible. Uh, so, like, like, I, I want to get into what we already kind of touched on in that, um, you know, this was all based on true events. The main character was actually based on one 
uh, one person, but you said mm-hmm. that your character was a mixture of people. And, and when you, um, you probably didn't know when you auditioned, right, who, what, what this was, but, but when after you booked it, did they give you like stuff to, to read or to research or to, to, to help you inform what this character might, might be or should be? Yes. So yes to your first question that, um, in in fact, in the first email, I did know that the show was going to be based off a book written by Alex Kershaw, mm-hmm. who is, he's devoted to World War II history, to honoring those heroes that not many of them are left. And so he's he's very consistent about being diligent and meticulous about the, the details in a story mm. of specific characters or characters he's covering. In The Liberator, his sole focus is Felix Sparks. Right. Felix Sparks spent... He's one of, I don't know, you can check my stats. I don't know if he was the one that spent the most time out in, in, on tour in World War II. He spent 500 days in battle, mm. um, more days than General Patton. Mm. And so the whole of the book is really to honor how Felix went through this whole thing and how a lot of his, his, uh, his brothers in arms were Native American and Latino American, whether they be Mexican American or Puerto, or Puerto Rican, mm-hmm. and and the lot of them went through this um, this whole tour. Now, the the book is obviously slightly different than the series, but the series is meant to honor the book in the best of its ability. The focus being Felix Sparks, but they the writer Jeb Stewart. Jeb Stewart wrote The Fugitive. He wrote Die Hard, um, amongst other things. He focused on telling the story in such a way that it would. Highlight Felix's story, but then give us a glimpse into these these less talked about groups. You know, the the Native American, the indigenous um, folks of, of of the United States of America, and then the Mexican Americans, the Latinos. So you have Gomez, who represented the Mexican American, the the Latino um, population of the time, and then Samuel Colfoot, who represented the the Native American um, people of the time. And, and the things they faced, the discrimination and the being treated as less than when, in fact, they turned out to be the most capable and the most effective on the battlefield. Um, the stories that are outside of the Liberator that go along those lines are, there's a plethora of them. When they are going to be told, I don't know. I, I do hope that this show, if it does anything, is that it starts to intrigue people on wanting more of those stories. Mm-hmm. Felix's story needed to be told. Felix's spark story needed to be told. It is such an important story, not just because of it highlighting the Native American and Mexican-American experience, but because Felix Sparks was someone that people did not know about Mm -hmm. and people needed to know about Felix Mm -hmm. because he was an American that really saw the American people for being American people, not because they were white or or whatever. You know, he found a way to kind of unify people for the cause of, We've got to do something greater than ourselves. Um, anyway, that's that's kind of like the element of based on real events that drove um, drove that story. Yeah, that's great. Um, and y- you had already mentioned a little bit about um, when you first found out it was animation when you auditioned mm-hmm. for it. After you had booked it, did you get to? Did they show you anything of like what the final product was was going to potentially look like? Yes. Um, in fact, the one of my favorite stories about the Liberator is this: we, when we r- arrived to Poland, they showed us the pitch video that the the production company. Now, mind you, the production company Trio Scope Studios is based out of Atlanta. They were originally just based out of Atlanta, and they've expanded. Now they have studios in LA and kind of all over the globe now. Um, but at the time, they they developed this pitch video for. A&E Studios and it's oh I don't know maybe it's like a five minute video and it gave us a sample of what this world is going to look like and I was extremely intrigued and blown away because it looked like animation the world but the the, the people were people um, and it, and I'll tell you this much the pitch video was I would say less than in quality as from the final um, final show as, mm-hmm. as we know it now mm-hmm. um, but sitting there watching that pitch video the thing that moved me the most is that there is it's the scene in the show where um, Felix Sparks is being 
they sent they basically sent a marshal to arrest him yeah. while he's in the in the yeah. battlefield. The actor who plays that marshal, he waited three years for his callback. His name is Harrison Stone. He booked the pitch video three years ago. And then they liked him so much, they brought him back to play the same role for the show. And when he gets that call, man, unbelievable, the feeling he had. Um, and Guy is an amazing human, and we obviously hit it off over there, and we had a great time and all this and that and the other. But then the story gets better for Harrison. The show premieres November 11th of this year, exactly three years to the day that he found out he had a call back for the show. Or actually, no, I'm sorry, for the day they were filming the pitch video. That's it. November oh, 11th, wow. 2017, they were filming the pitch video. Mm. And the actual show premieres on, mm. on November 11th. Incredible. Yeah. But I, that's when I, when I saw that, uh, that pitch video, I was like, okay, this is what we've gotten ourselves yeah. into. But, then, but the, thing, the main thing that Greg, uh, Greg, Greg Junk Titus, he's, he's Polish, but he's, he's well known. He's done a lot of work with Marvel and Star mm-hmm. Wars. And he, the guy is a genius in terms of visual effects and storytelling. He told us right off the bat, this whole show is centered around the actor's performance. Mm -hmm. We're going to build this world around what you guys bring to the table. And that's why we picked you, because you guys just stood out, and we just know this is going to work. And and to to hear it right out of the gate from his mouth and Jeb's mouth that the driving force was going to be this ensemble piece, I mean, as an actor, that's like like your dream to hear that, right? and so we just we ran with that, and and uh, but you know as we filmed, we were in this big blue bowl. All of it was a blue studio. Um, wow! Yeah, I, I, for the most part, that was something I wanted. I was interested in is yeah. is uh, was any of it like on location in a in in like a t- nothing everything like a hundred percent of what you did was a hundred percent in blue. Wow! In blue, that's incredible. Yes. I know. I like know. just like driving through the little small towns and stuff like that, yep. like that's incredible. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like you know the the uh, the, the technology that's uh, that's starting right now with uh, the Mandalorian too, like the way yes. they shoot that, the like, volume, you know, right? The yeah. LED spherical yeah. thing, yeah. Man, mm-hmm. what they're able to do now! With, it is. Um, it, it's really getting exciting, man. So, so then my question is, why do they film it in Poland? If could they have done it and like in Atlanta? Yes, the answer to that yes is yes, but it, it was because of the proximity to World War II. That events. makes sense. Yep. You know they wanted us to have, although we because they knew they knew that if they, if this is going to work, they needed to embed us in in the element of this story. Mm-hmm. We were, I think, we were 30, 40 minutes away from one of the biggest ghettos in mm. in in the history of World War II, mm. Jewish ghettos. I mean, yeah. Um, it was the, I forget the exact name, but it was in Wuj. Wuj is the city we filmed in. And we were, you know, uh, a day's drive from Auschwitz. And wow. we went to Auschwitz to prepare for a lot of those parts of the show. Oh, wow. Uh, just walking through Poland, you can still feel the weight of World War II, you know? Yeah, yeah. This heavily, heavily industrialized nation, um, you could feel it on the people, mm. um, you know, not just from World War II, but the effects of the Cold War and, and the 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 presence of of um, the Soviet Union and all that and so it, it just ties you to history mm-hmm. you know you you literally all you need to do is step out of your hotel room or step out of the studio and you're there mm-hmm. you're just there and it helped it helped immensely um, had we shot it here I don't know that we would have had the same kind of um, the same kind of feel you know um, you know I try to imagine what those soldiers must have gone through landing in these um foreign lands foreign languages you know uh and and i think that's the the sense of what we got you know we we were there and away from your families away from right yeah yeah. the only people you can confide in your brothers now that become Mm. your brothers because you're there with them Mm. and it it just um it added to the element of the whole sense 100 percent. i'm sure it definitely helps from from uh actor's preparation standpoint to to Mm -hmm. be able to draw upon that uh yeah definitely did man yeah wow um so i mean that 
it it definitely answered a lot of my questions already just just from you saying that it was all shot in the little blue bubble what do you call it a blue bowl a blue it's bowl a, i don't i won't take credit for that that's bradley james okay who is the lead of the show he he coined that phrase okay it, it felt like a blue bowl like a blue yeah. fish bowl we were just like <laughs> we're this is it this is our world for for two months um for for some people creatively it was difficult um a lot of the production design folks they were it was driving them nuts uh, not to have yeah. actual physical structure and tangibility to the different So pictures. the things that you did have, I mean, there were obviously some props and set deck yes. incorporated, mm -hmm. but but environment-wise, like uh, anything past, what, like 10 feet of what you're talking about? Yeah, it, it, um, it, well, sometimes even more. They would give us, um, depending, because obviously they're also playing to what they're going to have to paint in later, if you right. will. Right. Um, but it, to give you a feel more of the actor's perspective, it, it felt a lot like theater. It, oh, if you've done theater before, yeah, 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 it, yeah, yeah, it feels a lot like you're on stage, and and you know if you're, you know, if you're doing a show like 1984 where you're in the city and you have to look out to the, out the buildings mm -hmm. and there's a helicopter all of a sudden, and uh, you know, or if you're doing Christmas Carol and, and you're out in London Street and you but you're on a stage, right? Mm -hmm. But they give you enough. The, okay. the crew gives you enough so that you can set your imagination on, okay, I'm in London right now. Yeah. We're walking through the snow and yeah. the goose uh, in the window because, yeah. I've, you know, we've kind of figured out the eyeline of that. So the, that kind of collaboration was going on. So the, the collaboration itself reminded me very much of theater. There were times where it felt like black box theater where there's very little. You just yeah. have like a, blo a block. Yeah, you know, when you yeah. do black box theater, you get a black block and then that's it that's your sofa or your yeah. bench <laughs> or your car <laughs> or your car yeah, exactly yeah so it, it reminded me very much of of that where you're really relying on this on this connection yeah. with your with your scene partner and i love that stuff what like, about this like the scenes like the war scenes like gunfire and all of that stuff are you do are you getting audio cues for for that we, we get we get audio cues okay. and then they would they would throw these like rubber foamy things at us with to, to kind of uh you know manifest this physical like explosions debris, and things yeah, happening falling us oh, right yeah. so we would have um we would have all kinds of cues eye lines wow. and such um if you remember there's a there's a scene in episode three where we're running down this open open hill and there's a sniper right i don't know if you remember yeah that yeah, yeah but yeah, like yeah. for example that yeah. was that was a big ramp they had in the studio that we had to run down wow. a big blue ramp yeah um, it was probably a good oh i don't know 50 feet in length wow. uh, on a slope obviously and then they would have this padded area where you'd have to kind of sprint down this ramp yeah and you know someone would catch us because we're coming down with that momentum so it was very physical i mm. man i lost so much weight there i loved it <laughs> i was in such great by the end of those two months i could have done a spartan race and probably placed easy yeah yeah <laughs> that's today, incredible probably not today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I loved it. It was a very physical demeanor, indeed. Um, I'm looking at, I'm looking over here on my other screen of like some of the questions that I've written down, and like all of them had to do like how much of it was green screen, how much of it was like on location, like yeah, everything yeah. is just. I can't believe like all of it um, was just done in that that location. Um, is there anything that that uh, they told you to do or that you um, needed to do specifically? for the animation aspect of it from from um, an acting standpoint was there anything no, it was just all no, no, no. okay yeah it was it was very authentic and very, very cool. um very in the moment they, that's what i loved about the way we filmed that it was very live action they yeah. you didn't you didn't have to like i mean apart from the action stuff where you had to really place some of the you know the running the, the incoming german soldiers or the you know the some of the the bombshells that were going, the shelling that was going to start going on, um, some of that had to be matched up. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as just the intricacies and the little nuances, little moments, no, that was just very actor to actor. Like I wow. said, I, I absolutely love that yeah. part, uh, part about it. Um, I'll tell you, one of the challenging things as an actor was getting the accent right, um, getting a period right, okay, and, and that it would represent the Mexican American community uh, to the best of my ability. Right. Um, so I, I had to do. I had to spend some time on that because it, it it wasn't it wasn't gonna sound. I didn't want it to sound like 
today, like a contemporary Mexican American. Right. So that part was very challenging. And did honest. you do an accent for your audition? Um, I gave them two takes, one with and one without. Okay. Mm-hmm. Oh. And it was at the table read in Poland that I realized, oh, they really want it. They want an accent, so we're gonna we're gonna make sure we get this. Gotcha. Um, ironed gotcha. Out. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this uh, uh, last, I think, last question. Maybe I'll have another follow up after this, but <laughs> um, but uh, let's bring it back to the fact that this was overseas. That you, um, like you said, for your family, it was the first time that you were gonna be away for so long. Um, what was that like to, to, to have to, you know, go away for two months, um, Mm. for work, you know, which is amazing, but then, then, you know, you have to be away from, you know, all the people that you love for that extended period of time. It was very stressful, Mm. extremely stressful. I mean, it was stressful for me, but I had the easy end of the stick really because I'm over there and all I'm worried about is getting my job done. Yeah. I mean, literally everything else was taken care of for me. Here, my dear bride, my wife, God bless her, um, she she had a full-time job still at the time and dealing with the kids' school. And they were, there was a lot going on with school, um, a lot going on, a lot of the stuff that I used to take care of while I was home, she had to now do. Plus, um, take care of our, our well, our, our dog was still fairly a puppy. So th- it was just a lot for mm-hmm. her to do. Three kids, a pup, a household, and a full-time job where she was one of the leaders at her job. Um, it was very, 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 very stressful for her. Um, she is, she's kind of my superhero in real mm-hmm. life that she got through that period, um, you know. And we had a six-hour difference. So trying to communicate with each yeah, other and talk yeah, yeah. was a nightmare at mm-hmm. times. An absolute nightmare at times, really, to, to try to coordinate because I'd... Uh, you know, there'd be times she's going to bed and, or rather I'm going to bed and they're waking up. It was just weird. It was a very strange, mm-hmm. um, it was not, I mean, talk, people talk about being jet lagged. We were like family lagged. <laughs> it yeah. was really, we were just off, not on the yeah. same page for quite a while. Um, so yeah, it was very, very challenging. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to highlight that specifically for, I think a lot of younger actors, or not necessarily younger, but pe- just people that are early on in their careers, I've definitely uh, had this experience where, you, uh, you know, you learn and you grow as you do more in this industry. And one of the things that you do end up learning is that there are going to be times where this does feel like a job, right? When you're first yeah. getting started, you're like, acting, oh my God, I would do this 24-7, you know, I'll do it for free, you know, all these things. And, but then there are times where you realize, all right, this is really is work. Um, mm-hmm. As much as I love it, there are going to be times where I really wish I was at home. I really yeah. wish yeah. Um, I re- really wish I had a day off and I wasn't doing this today, mm-hmm. right? And um, and and that's that's something that that is, is real. And it's it's um, uh, I remember the first time that I kind of experienced it, not for myself. But I remember being on, you know, when we're first getting started, we're just day players, we're co-stars, we're on set for like a day or two or a week at most. And I was on set for this Netflix project and I remember one of the series regulars just offhand making a comment of, man, tomorrow's going to be my first day off in three weeks. And I had never heard anybody refer to acting in that way of like because I had you know <laughs> yeah. from from my background working as a, in the in the corporate world of people saying I can't wait for the weekend I can't wait to take my yeah. uh, PTO day and take a vacation or whatever right. I never heard an actor talk about not wanting to be on set you know mm-hmm. and because like I said when we're first getting started we just want to be on set all right. the time as much as right. we want and uh, and that was the first like eye opening uh, experience oh, of, sure. of like thinking about it I'm like. That does make sense. If she is here 12, 14 hours a day as a series regular, you know, every day, there's, I'm sure there are days where you just wish yep. you had a day off, even no matter how much you love it. And I remember seeing a quote recently. I can't remember who uh, it's from, but I remember seeing it about, you know, being a professional means uh, doing the things that you love to do, even on the ways, days that you don't want to do it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it, yeah. it's a, and there are going to be days that, and as much as we love acting, that may not want to do it. There are other yeah. things that, that are, you know, priorities. Mm-hmm. That's right. And I, that even applies, I don't know if you feel this way, um, with auditions. Oh, there are 100%. times where, yeah. yeah, where you're like, oh, well, I guess I got to do this one, you know, and it's like, yeah. And, but, you know, I, it's, so, it's such a thin line because I never, ever want to be ungrateful. I never want to be like, oh, no, man, gosh, I have to do another audition for a big TV show. Yeah. This is terrible. Like, no, man. And there's I a never... million actors who are just, like, begging exactly. for the one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, no, I don't want to be that. But, you know, there is a sense of, like, honoring the fact that I feel like, you know, I've, I, I, I know I have this audition to do, but it just, it is work, and it feels like work. and. Mm-hmm. I can't wait to be done with it and submit it and it's done or same thing and you know I've like like I hinted at before the liberator it was the first time I've ever been on a set to this degree Mm -hmm. um it took I would say almost all of the two months for me to be like I would like a day off um Mm. because I just loved it Mm. I absolutely loved it um you know when but I don't I'll tell you what I didn't love was feeling the pool that that I felt from home, the yeah. the necessity to be home and to help out, yeah. that wasn't fun. That was never fun from the, from day one. <laughs> yeah. Um. But the work itself, yeah. um. I, I, I. There were days that I was off. That I was like, "Can I go in? I mean, do you guys mind <laughs> if I hang out on set?" <laughs> yeah. Um. And they're like, "Sure, if you don't <laughs> mind." And I was like, "No way, I don't mind. I, I made it as much as I could." I, I absolutely loved every second of it. Um, that's incredible. That's the that, those are the types of experiences that you want, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean that really the people too. You know, yeah. the, I think that does add to it. You know, if yeah. if it's the wrong, you know, I, I heard Chris Evans talk about this with us, um, Scarlett Johansson, and that actors, actors. I've been mm-hmm. watching those. Can you tell? I've been <laughs> it's like third example I told you. Yeah. He told he was telling Scarlett this. You know, if if. Sure, it's Captain America because he was talking about how you know I don't know if I, I didn't really want to do that and but it's it's not even the role. It's sometimes if I sign on to work with these group of people for the next not even just a few months but potentially years. Right. What if I don't like them? Right. What if we don't get along? Right. right? Mm-hmm. Um, which was not. I mean, my scenario in Poland was I got along with everybody. Everybody got along with me, and and everyone was really getting along in general. So it was it was such a great place to be and to work. Like why wouldn't I? What, what am I gonna do? Be in the hotel with myself? Yeah. Do what? Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, I could only work out for so long before <laughs> I get bored. Right. And then eventually, I was like, I'd shower up and be like, um, hey, you know, call the I'd call the producer, PA. Do you guys mind if I just van over and just kind of hang out? And and they're like, come on over, man. So awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's just something you do, and you, especially. Especially when you feel like, you know, I don't know when this will happen again anytime soon, yeah. so let me milk it, you know? So there it is. <laughs> well, I, that, yeah, that's, that's amazing. And I think that's a great place to end on, uh, is that, that, that the, that's the feeling that we all want uh, when we're on set, yeah. to, to, to have it um, be basically what we've always dreamed of it being, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah, incredible. Man. And I, and I want to just take it back to the one thing that you mentioned about them saying that they want it to be actor focused and about the stories of of the people and and I think you guys accomplished it for sure um, Thank you, man. from both both the both the from from the filmmaking side of it and then all the performances I can't I can't uh, leave actually without m- mentioning uh, your friend Luca um, who <laughs> I got to I got to meet right um, he yes uh, he, it was really interesting seeing his character because <laughs> he's from uh, England and right. he plays this kid from Boston. <laughs> yeah. And yes. hey, he does a great job with that Boston accent. Yes. I mean, yes, he um, did. if you talk to him, let him know that that, that, that was I really, will. I will. That, I'll that let was, him know. That was really cool uh, to see him pop up. I mean, I knew because you guys had talked about it, I knew that he was going to be in it. Um, but I didn't know what character it was going to be. And it was, you know, that was a funny thing. Like, they cast so many American actors. But then for this, like, specifically Boston guy, it was my dog, like, popping up yeah. into the screen. <laughs> but but then this specific, like, Boston role, they bring in this kid from uh, from London to, to play. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, man. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. You met him. He's an awesome yeah. dude. Yeah. Everyone, really, like I told you. And, and 
And you're right, man, that the, the whole cast, they, we just all were focused on each other's work and the ensemble, yeah. I think. I feel the same way. I, I, I got to see the show far enough after it being done that I really got to have a spectator's type oh, of great. view. And yeah. I really enjoyed it, too. Um, you know, there's things that we can talk about probably in another episode of this sure. on, on story elements and, and things like that and, and the way they told the story. But as a whole, my, my immediate reception of it was, I loved it. I really did. I want to rewatch it. I've only seen it once through. Yeah. Um, and there's things that I'd like to watch it just to see it again, fresh eyes and, and such. But I'm glad, I'm glad you watched it. Thank you for spending time with the show, man. I'm, it means a lot to me. Like I said, your, your insight is, is, it matters. Yeah, man, I really loved it. So for people that haven't seen it, definitely go check it out. It's called The Liberator. You'll find it on Netflix. Um, it's four episodes. It's it's uh, you, I mean, you can binge it over an afternoon. So it's and, and it's uh, like we said, it's a true story. Um, really, you know, um, you know, I think touching and heartfelt tribute to this guy, Felix Sparks, and then and, and the people that he uh, that he led into war. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. We're we're running out of time because I actually have to not not only walk my dog and then get to a dentist appointment as well so <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna hop off now but thank you so much jose for for joining me and and talking about not just the liberator but everything else we discussed uh prior my pleasure man i i certainly hope it helps anyone listening you know and encourages yeah. them to continue on the journey it's a beautiful one it's a tar it's a tough one yeah. but it's so worth it you know you meet great people along the way like yourself and I look forward to many, many other projects with you, brother. Um, it, it is likewise. It is truly, truly exciting to, to think that I've I've met folks like you along this way. So I wish you well on your dentist day and on your walk with <laughs> your pup. I'll probably fingers crossed, no now. cavities. Yes, yeah. that's always the hope. Yeah. Uh, but again, man, thank you for giving the shout out to the Liberator and spending some time with me today. Um, let's do it again sometime, man. I, I've got questions for you, so at some point I got to interview you some more. All right. I, I was left with a lot of questions on pause because I know we're running okay. out of time. But we will have to do a part two of this, please, or three, whatever you end up doing. In Sounds good, man. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, man. You take right. it easy. Take it easy. You too. All right, man. Thank you so much. All right, that's it for today's video. I want to thank Jose one more time for coming on to this channel and thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and if you have any questions, leave them down in the comments below. Don't forget to check out Jose's channel, Magilive. That's also linked in the description down there. Until next time, keep practicing, keep learning, and I hope to see you on set one day.